Free. Here. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. It's October the 20... I'm sorry, Dina. November the 9th. I was just watching a video in October. It's November the 9th, 2016. Dana, your host, the nuclear proctologist, .org. And you can find these videos in Fukushima presentations throughout the entire internet. We are privileged and pleased, once again, to be streaming live on such a difficult subject on a subject to where there's so many lies and misrepresentations and absolute deceit. We live in a time of liars. We live in a time of um, assassination upon this entire planet is what's happening to us from the nuclear industry. If you're not familiar with any of that, you got to get up to speed and what better way than right here, a beautiful girl by Dana on YouTube, the nuclearproctologist.org, where we are the number one providers of Fukushima documentation. We're period, unchallenged. Our narrative is actually unchallenged. Everything we say is vetted. I say we when it's just me. And my water has little pieces of lemon in it. That's to turn the water into um, electrolysis, like Gatorade. You know how Gatorade, the electrolysis for your body. I'm sure that's not the right word we're looking for. Hugs for everybody. I know these streams are friggin' random as they get. Hi, ninth. 51, Jan Brooks, Miss Milky, has found a few moments to visit. She doesn't stop. And I never got your email yet, Jan. Sugar-free Trident, Trident, Trident. Albert, she's talking to her. Hey, hey, here, hey, Dana. And Elaine, of course, our moderator. And somebody has been an integral part of these expeditions. And we're extraordinarily grateful to that lady for her resolve. Again, I can't say thank you enough. I don't know how to say thank you enough, so I just keep saying it because I get some kind of, I get consoled by doing it. Maybe it's a better way to think about it. A quick, um, we got a couple of videos coming up right away. Uh, we also got to talk about, you know, as this is what I do full time. Uh, for the most part, it's strictly volunteer and it has escalated to research expeditions, to productions. We got a documentary about the rollout and uh, just this whole history of nuclear and Fukushima in particular, we have flushed this out beyond anything anybody else on the planet has even tried. And so Fukushima is not uh, a fable. Let me switch that out. I forgot we still had the flag. That's okay, though, of course. We'll bring in our big famous swipe. Here we go. Now, uh, before I get started, I'm going to remind everybody, I'm going to have to do this constantly. We, like, we can't exist. We can't be competitive uh, without your support. How can I possibly do everything I do without some kind of uh, donations? And for me to keep going and to keep expanding and to keep getting in their faces and everything else. I'm not sustainable yet on my own. And so this is probably the worst part of what I do. I have to ask people to support me, to donate. The links are below. If you don't, I have nothing. I have nothing. I can't accomplish anything. The last uh, week and a half or so, we raised 200. 
I went out and bought tools to replace uh, the thousand dollars worth of tools stole uh, from the boat uh, when we were down at court. And then, you know, I still haven't been able to replace the life jackets. And they're 300 bucks a pop. They stole all of that. They stole all the equipment on the boat, everything. Thousands and thousands and thousands. And so the only couple of hundred dollars that showed up, uh, I had to turn around and just get the tools so I can fix the boat and get it ready to head back out and do some more surveying. But I can't survey the coastline uh, without raising money. I can't, and we've been sitting here for like a year where we made two attempts to get out and we didn't raise enough money either time. Now take consideration of what I'm talking about is that boat is not cheap to turn the key. Just, uh, you know, I got to get the trailer uh, insured again. That's going to be, that's cheap, but it's still, it's $100 for that. Then it needs a new set of lights on the trailer because I'm going to get a friggin' big ticket. And I, this is five sets of lights, six sets of lights on that trailer in two years. We had to do the bearings twice on the trailer on top of that. And then I don't got no equipment inside the boat. They stole everything. And I can't even afford to put gas in the boat on top of that. And because I don't ask, and I have to ask, like we done this whole coastline because I continuously asked until it was done. But then we moved into this other stage. Now these are before and after pictures of the Canadian coastline. Just let me run through that for a second. Just think about the colors on the left-hand side. You would find that anywhere in British Columbia, Canada. But these are the before and after in the same place in Louise Narles and Haida Gwaii, formerly known as the Queen Charlotte, is up at the top towards the boat. You see uh, Prince Rupert, it's to the left. You see Port Clemens, you see Errol. Well, it's just below Errol. There's that big island on the inside. That's where all these pictures came from. Now, normally when you went there, the shoreline looks like that, not like this. Normally it looks like that and not like that, see? N never, ever. The entire coast is literally like this behind me when it's supposed to be like those pictures. And we done this because we raised the money to go do it. And I pushed hard, beyond anything conceivable and hard. And we need to keep doing that. There is nobody doing it. We are the last expedition to ever come out and do the coastline of Canada. We're the last species count on the coastline of Canada. And that is only because we can't raise the money or I don't push hard enough. But now I'm begging people to please support me. If everybody like donated $10 a month, I wouldn't have to humiliate myself constantly having to come out and ask for money. I'm sure of that. But I got no choice. Look, we have an extinction event. This is an extinction event. The things I got to do in this capacity is not going to last much longer. But if they do, I got to have your support. I'm not going to go away. I can't walk away from what we got done and what we're doing. And the documentary's coming. I do every radio interview, every symposium. Uh, film crews come up here. And, like, I do everything to push this out there. I sacrifice 24-7, gladly, willingly. And all I ask is people help make that possible. And if I don't ask, if people don't do it, I got to come out and, and in these videos, I got to take time and talk about that and the stress that goes with that. I'm under enormous amounts of stress because I can't even replace the life jackets. And if something, there's a whale or something dies out here, I can't go out. I don't have money sitting there. I don't have a tanks full of fuel. And I'm just saying, for goodness sakes, if you got anything extra, if you got in two houses and you're not using one, sell it and give me the money. If you got two cars and you're not using one you can afford, sell one of them, give me the money. You got any idea what I can do with a bit of money? <laughs> oh, man. I will wreck this industry.
if I ever gets my own way. I can do it on my own in that context, but I still have to have ability. So the two lectures in town that we just done, think about it, you know, it was $1,100 just for the last lecture. It was over 800 in advertisement. But what we did do was we blanketed the entire town with advertisement. So nobody in this town has gotten away from what we've done. From the Fukushima, nobody's getting away from that in this town. I'm pushing hard. I still haven't got that radio show up and running. I got so many things coming at me. And I met up with them last week and again. And it's probably this week or next week we should have our first show. Uh, there is no stopping for my future. I want to get out and do lectures. That takes money. I can't do it without the money. So I got to get the documentary out there and hopefully that makes enough, makes enough money that I can go out and do the lectures and do some expeditions. There's nothing left over ever. It's just like I need to spend at least 2000 on the boat and equipment minimum to get that back up to speed. Like it's daunting for me. And that's not counting filling the friggin' thing up <laughs> to go out. Just, I'm just, we just talked for how long? 20 minutes? Okay, let's go back. And I'll do that at the beginning of every show if I got to. I'm not going to like it. I'm sure nobody else will like me doing it, but. Okay. Let's talk about a nuclear expert. What does that mean, Dana, a nuclear expert? Is he like just some random guy or is he some super nuclear expert? Okay, he's actually supposed to be. And we'll play that. Watch your audio. Three, two, one. Williams College, 2011. That was the month after. Robert Button it. My name is Tiku Majumdar. I'm the Sorry. Uh, professor in the physics department as well as the current director of the Science Center at Williams. And it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Budnitz. And let me just say a few words about him. Um, in addition to being someone with impressive national and global uh, insights and connections to this important topic um, about which he'll speak tonight. Now, this was about a month or so after, two months after Fukushima. And he's introducing um, Robert Butnick. And here's his qualifications coming up. Um, he's a person who has some interesting local connections, and I thought I would mention those as well. Um, we're grateful that he's here this month and that, that he's willing to, uh, to join us um, and talk to us this evening. He's an expert on nuclear power, on reactor safety, on waste management and safety. Uh, he graduated from Pittsfield High School, uh, married locally and uh, his, uh, into the Presky family, a family who's, who's, uh, who's very well known and whose generosity is very well known on this campus. Um, he was a graduate of Yale College. So he comes from a, he's married into a very wealthy family. Just sickening amount of wealth. Yeah? Keep listening. College and uh, got his PhD in experimental physics from Harvard. Uh, then went to Lawrence Berkeley Lab where he worked in the energy and environment division, including a stint as head of that division. Uh, did a stint in, in the Nuclear Reg uh, Regulatory Commission. Then on to Lawrence Livermore National Lab, including uh, work with the Department of Energy. Back to Lawrence Berkeley Lab where he is now. And in particular, uh, it's important to note that when the Obama administration wanted to put together a kind of a local U.S. Uh, task force to coordinate reactions to the Fukushima um, disaster uh, that uh, Energy Secretary Steve Chu put together a panel of five U.S. scientists, including uh, Robert Budness. So it's uh, particularly um, a great pleasure to welcome him to Williams, not to Williamstown, but to Brooks Rogers Hall, maybe to this evening. So is he gullible? Is he naive? Does he sound like somebody who He's just talking out of his ear. That's cut the speaker coming up. He's, he sounds like he's he's Harvard. He went to Berkeley. Lost at Livermore Lab, which is uh, the hell on earth spot in America. 
This is Robert. <coughs> I'm going to light up a cigarette. My cigarettes don't have 7,000 chemicals. They're the green CNT, Canadian natural tobacco, as grown in America. <laughs> but anyway, it doesn't have 7,000 chemicals. Now, this is so important tonight. We're just going to go ahead and play. It's one minute, one ten second, one minute and ten seconds long. And before I start, uh, next week we're going to start our show at regular time, ten thirty a.m. Uh, five days a week, except for the twenty second. The twenty second, I got to be in court. <laughs> we can do the show later that day. Uh, let's keep going because they arrested me again, remember, <laughs> for doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> here we go. One last thing. I'm going to go back up here. Unit 4 didn't have any fuel in the reactor. The fuel was in the spent fuel pool. Right, and in the spent fuel pool was five more reactor cores. Let's go look at that right quick. I just split it right there so we can find our way back. Okay. Here's unit four. I'll bring it up into the big shop pictures. Knock Dana in there while we're at it. Okay. So the pool above me is the pool he's going to be talking about, but it, he's supposed to be in the building to your left. To your left. So that's number four to your left. But look at a beautiful picture right here. Uh, the World Nuclear News. Quite a lot of people have done it. BBC came out and showed you a perfect building inside of these destroyed. These are number four. This is what he's going to be talking about. Uh, just to clarify, this is Seth Dorn from CBS and uh, PBS. He's claiming to be inside of the building behind me in that capture from a video that we normally play. So he's claiming to be inside of that building. This is the same fable Robert's going to try to tell you, but he's going to tell you less than uh, six weeks after the accident. So here's his version. So the hydrogen explosion that blew off that roof couldn't have come from the fuel in the reactor. Now he's saying that because the reactor cores were in the fuel pool, but the fuel pool had five more reactor cores in the building. So they store the reactor cores in the building for 10 years. It's important you understand that part. For the first month, we, the community of experts, we were sure that that was because the spent fuel pool had somehow lost cooling. It was a fresh core, remember? Just had been offloaded. It, and, and it generated hydrogen from that. Now, the hydrogen he's talking about is not like the hydrogen you're familiar with, and I like the hydrogen cars or hydrogen power packs. This is nuclear hydrogen. Now, this kind of hydrogen we're talking about, uh, it just needs oxygen to ignite. It doesn't need a flame or something, okay? But finally, six weeks later, uh, the Japanese went in and looked, and it's fine. It's full of water, and there's no radioactivity. It wasn't that. So what he's saying, let's cut that off right here and come back to it after. So what he's saying is the fuel pools were fine in the building above you. He's claiming before those pictures even showed up that they looked like that, that is fine. Because that would be fine, what you're looking at below. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison. Now, do you really think for even one second that the two depictions on the right are inside the depiction on the left. Uh, if you do, we can't help you. There's nobody can help you because you can't reason on your own if you can't look at that and come to the, the right conclusion that you have to be gullible to conceive that. Or you have to be someone like this. So how did this hydrogen get over here? Well, there's a pipe that goes from unit three to a stack to unit four. And it, as best we can tell, it went across this, this pipe, although we cannot. Now he's saying that because he's saying that there was no damage to the building that's destroyed. Once again, let's look at the building that he's talking about. 
Seth Dorn is there when he tore it all down. Here's another depiction of Seth before they tore it down. So he's saying there's no way there's a release in that building on your right-hand side. It had to come from a different place. It couldn't have come from the building on your right-hand side. That's his words, not my words. That's his words. So how did this hydrogen get over here? Well, there's a pipe that goes from unit three to a stack to unit four. And it, as best we can tell, it went across this, this pipe, although we can't understand why it should have, but it, it must have and filled up this building and we had an explosion over there. And it seems very, very unlikely. There are check valves and they're very strong and we don't understand it, but there's no other uh, explanation. Besides the fact that the buildings are destroyed or the fact that there was five reactor cores are already in uh, spent fuel pools at the top of the building that don't exist anymore? In fact, I'm fond of saying something that perhaps you remember. Uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes once said that if you ruled out all the impossible things, then the really unlikely thing is it. Well, this is really unlikely. We just don't think, but it's, but it's got to be. But it's got to be. So he should lose his degrees. He should be um, challenged by the universities. He should be challenged by all the academics. And uh, he won't be. This is what they do for a living. Now, remember, he married into a very wealthy family because he's... he's uh, it goes to show you what that family is like that he comes from. That these are twisted, sickening, soulless, spineless. Oh, never mind. Let's keep going. Well, they are. Okay, this next one is 2 minutes 40 seconds. We're going to be stopping several times. I'm going to talk about radio. Hi, Lonnie. Because we got Lonnie in so the comment section. I... Lonnie's nuts for her. Hi, Lonnie. Uh... That's not Lonnie. That's Lonnie. And Todd, just normal TV. Well, it's not right, see? And Chenty smurfed up. Good job, Elaine. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Tree Wolf. And anybody I didn't get rid to. His name is Robert. And I played it at the beginning. Butnitz. B U D N I T Z. So Chenty wasn't political, just made a joke. Well, I don't know what happened. Elaine doesn't remove people unless it's, there's a controversy that shouldn't be there. Tom Tom got banned. And Elaine has to do that. She knows the rules. She knows what she's supposed to do. Skid mark is gone. Good. And this is normal that we get attacked by these people. And thank goodness for Elaine taking up this terrible task. Uh, who would want this job? I know. But Elaine, she knows what she's supposed to do, and so I don't question her. And I know Elaine good enough. I don't have to. And neither do you. So let's keep going with the video. This is um, 2 minutes 40 seconds. Once again, we're going to be jumping in and out. Oh, knock me back into the picture. I'm going to talk about radioactivity because I'm going to explain what the significance was of the releases. Now, remember, he got uh, degrees from Harvard. He, he went to Berkeley. He was at the Los uh, Alamos, Los Livermore, nuclear world's most secretive nuclear facility repeatedly, et cetera, et cetera. Now, listen to what this man is saying about man-made radiation. This is what he's going to do to you. You can see what he's doing right here. But listen to his own words. I have to talk about the average dose to people in the United States, and this is true in Japan. Now, you can't get a dose from natural radiation. You don't get a dose. Everything on the planet, my clothing is full of that radiation. This is full of that radiation. It's not radiation. Everything around me and around you and your entire body is full <coughs> it's full of what they call, there's about 160 emitters on the planet in the solar system. But none of, you can eat grams of that stuff, it can't hurt you. But if you pick up a gram of man made, you will, you, if it was right alongside me, I'd be dead in less than a minute. A gram. The room was full of people. That, that gram will kill everybody in the room in a few minutes. And that a single atom. Now, a gram a man made, 
has 88 curries, and a curry is 78 billion atoms. So 88 times 78 billion. But each one of those atoms can give you a cancer uh, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, just a single atom. There's 88 times 78 billion. But for man-made, there's 160,000. None of them can hurt you, and the rest is just natural stuff that are not emitters. So let's play what he's going to say. Also, uh, the average person, you and me and everybody else here, uh, not counting medical. Now, a gram of man-made stuff will power a million one-watt bulbs. A million for up to nine months. A gram of natural won't even, you know, get the, a light bulb to dim, let alone to be bright, let alone a million of them. So a gram of natural, irrelevant, a gram of man-made, most frightening thing on the planet. Radiation. We all get between two and 300 millirem per year. Millirem. Now, we can't get millirems. We don't actually get, that's a lie, that's a fable. We are acclimated to the natural stuff through genetic superior selection, through millenniums. The same as everything else on the planet. We live in harmony with the natural emitters. They're irrelevant. They're part of everything in our home. There's no harm to nobody that can't mutate a fruit fly. And so your body treats as homeostasis. So say if I'm eating food with potassium-40, my body can only hold so much potassium-40. When I eat some, I displace the extra automatically. My clothing will do the same thing. This will do the same thing. If I put more potassium-40 on paint, it can't hold anymore. And, but your body and animals and insects and everything treats natural radiation that he's talking about that way. But man-made, we sequester it. We can hold billions of man-made, endless, and all of it will hurt you. But natural, we can't get any more than we're already gifted with through uh, nature. There's a unit of radiation dose. And a lot of it comes from the rock. Now, if you were getting 200 millisieverts a year of man-made, um, the numbers on that, well, a millisiever would be 150 counts a minute. Yeah? So 200 times 150 counts a minute. 55 counts is an evacuation zone. So 200 times 150 is a no-go zone forever and ever, yeah? So there's a big difference. Rocks in the soil that we live on, and so it varies a lot. From, if you're in the Berkshires, you get more than if you're along the coast. No, you don't get more. Your body can't get more. It's called homeostasis. Your body doesn't hold any more natural. You can go anywhere on the planet. It's irrelevant. You're not going to die sooner because you went up in a mountain or on a plane or something. And uh, there's some cosmic radiation. And if you move to... Cosmic radiation is not radiation. You can have a chain reaction with cosmic radiation. We can't live without the sunshine. Nothing on the planet would be here without the sunshine. So why is he saying that? He's saying it to confuse everybody that was sitting there. Denver, you get a lot more because it's, it's higher and there's more in the rocks and more... No, there's not more in the rocks because it's higher. This is from Harvard. He's from Harvard University. And we can't trust him. So just with what he said already, you can never trust anything he's ever said or will ever say again. That's the default when someone says that. When someone says it's like natural radiation, you have to switch him off. You have to walk away. You have to contact that university and complain about him. You need a million people to go after him right now because he's a very harmful, dangerous psychopath. Cosmic radiation. We had a, a granddaughter living in Boulder for a while. And Using his own children's children as an example to trick and deceive people. You tell me that's not the lowest form of life. Colorado and up there instead of uh, about 300, they get about twice that. Wow, twice as much sunshine. Twi like, your body can't hold anymore. Your body can't hold any more natural. But if it's man-made, it won't stop sequestering in your organs and your muscles and your bones. And you'll produce white blood cells for decades, attacking every one of them. And you'll displace all the oxygen in your body. If 
I climb up a mountain, I got less oxygen because I'm higher. So to come down, everything is normal again. There's no adverse effects. So the natural sources of radioactivity and a little bit from consumer products are about 300 milligrams per year or 200, it varies. Kind of like your IQ. And on average in the United States, and this is true in every advanced country like Japan, there's another... Every advanced country. <laughs> so if you're poor, it doesn't happen. <laughs> the 300 or so that comes from medical. Not everybody... 300 from medical, but you get 200 from nature. <laughs> Do you see the game they're using on you? You see the trick? You see the deception? That's how they lull you into using that stuff. Everybody gets chemotherapy, except for 3% dies before they would have without the chemo. You live longer without the chemo. Right? There's a better way of looking at it. Everybody dies before they would have died if they didn't take the chemo. You take the chemo, you die way quicker. There's no survival. 3% live. And most likely, the majority of them didn't have cancer. Misdiagnosed. Remember, over the last decade, there was over 6 million women misdiagnosed with breast cancer. You tell me the industry is not insane. Nobody ever holds any of them accountable. They're allowed to, to murder you and destroy you and confuse everybody that listens to them. That's the norm. Is that the world we thought we lived in? Is that something we're supposed to covet? That all the experts are nothing but malicious lawyers? He gets it. I mean, I, did, I had some last year and the year before I didn't. You know how it is. But the average is people get about another 300 milligram. And I He's talking about from medical. Now that stuff is completely different than the first 200. These are completely different. They got nothing to do with each other, but he just conflated them, yeah? On average in the United States, somebody, uh, just a normal citizen, gets about 600, as it says, 620. No, that's not true. You can't get millirins from nature. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't have that energy. It doesn't have that chemical um, fluctuation. It's an absolute deception. Now, I want you to keep those milliram in mind because I'm about to describe the impact. He's about to manipulate. Impact on Japan. The and, impact on and Japan. And they're about the same. And now he's claiming they're about the same. See? And by the way, nobody thinks that 600 milliram is a terrible health hazard. Uh, 600 milligrams is not a terrible house. Uh, okay, hang on. Let's do something. Let's do something with a calculator. 600. I'm going to bring it up, Dana, or it doesn't work. 600 times 150 counts per minute. That's 90,000 counts per minute. And he says there's no uh, repercussions for that. Okay. I'm going to dispute that now, ain't I? Dana, two Danas. Oh, my God, there's not two Danas. That's not the one we're looking for. I got too many mouse. Dana, stop clicking shit, Dana. 40 million backwards. Normally, you package food up at five, not 40 million. Dr. Raymond Gilman, from Loveless Respiratory Research Institute, New Mexico. I got 94 peer review studies. You can see this one on beagle dogs and beagle puppies. And every dog died in every study. So 144 dogs in this one. Look at your third sentence, or even your second one. Radiation deaths occurred from 1.5 to 5.4 years in 144 dogs. Bone tumors in 93 dogs, lung tumors in 46, livers, tumors in 20, and tumors in these three organs often occurred in the same animal. But those dogs only had one inhalation, one mono dispersal. They weren't eating it, breathing it, drinking it, washing their clothing in it, they're walking in the rain, washing their vehicles, blah, blah, blah. Let's keep going. 
So his words don't carry any validity, yeah? Because when people look and study, and I said you move to Denver, you get twice as much, you study that, you move to higher elevation, you get even more. Studies haven't shown any, uh, any observable effects from that, although there, there's some suspicion there may be some. There, if there, there. Yeah, go look at Dr. Raymond Gilnetti's studies, or the millions of studies on animals, and every animal died for the last 70 years in every country. Not just North America killing animals, right? It must be very small because they never see anything from this. It takes much higher doses than that to cause trouble. Now, here's a map. Like, a single atom will get you 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. But there's 1,800 diseases, illnesses, autoimmune deficiencies will show up long before the cancer. Heart, liver, lung, respiratory, pituitary, adrenaline, Alzheimer's, dementia, autism, diabetes. Well, I'll show up before the cancer. So that's why he's saying it the way he said it. Or Japan. Oh. Or Japan. No effects for them. Or J so unless you're getting 90,000 counts per minute, nothing to worry about. And even then, ah, the science is still out, which is not true. We showed you Dr. Raymond Gilmetti's uh, This was studies. In, uh, in early April, and these blue lines are just flight patterns of an American plane that was flying, measuring airborne radioactivity, but that's not the... Yeah, so there was an American plane was down there measuring the radioactivity. Did you hear about it? Did you get those numbers? Did you read about it? No? Did the media report on it? No? Point of the slide. There's that red dot is where the reactors are. And the first circle is 20 kilometers, that's 12 miles. The next circle is 30 kilometers, about 19 miles. And the biggest circle is 80 kilometers, about 50 miles. So these are 12, uh, about 20, and about 50 mile circles around the reactor site. And this, this, these measurements were made uh, three weeks after the accident, but it's about the same. And- But it's about the same. Now listen to what he's gonna say now. He's gonna talk about He's going to pretend it's just a single plume came out and that it was three or four miles wide and that was the disposition, the fallout, which is ludicrous. I'll show you some fallout charts after. When the releases occurred, the wind was blowing from southeast to northwest. Southeast to northwest. So when the accident occurred, so he's, he's, he's narrowing it down to just this one moment, just this one event, just this one release. This is what he's up to. But listen. And the big contamination in a zone here that you can see, it's yellow and sort of orange up here. And it extends about 20 miles out from the reactor site and is about three or four miles wide. And that's where the contamination is big. Everybody's been evacuated from this whole area, but in that area, they're not going to be able to reoccupy that for a long time. For a long time. You should try telling that to Japan because they're down there reoccupying that whole place. Okay, hang on. So, 75 miles away, half a million becquels a kilogram. This is catastrophic. That's catastrophic. Uh, that's 3,333 3, unisievers an hour, what you're looking at. A unisiever is enough to run away from. What's 3,300, I wonder? Falling from Fukushima causing problems 180 kilometers away. So right away, he's a lawyer. But he's working for these people, intelligent agencies, obviously. Hot particles, 400 kilometers, 40 billion becquels a kilogram. And I'm not going to try to do the unisiever conversion on that. It's 40 times 6,666 unisievers. So 40 times 6,666.66666666667. For anybody that's going to ninny me. Dana don't know he's mad. That's the mad. Look it up. Nearly 5,000 plant workers. These were homeless, destitute immigrants. Now, if nuclear was harmless like he was saying... This was the accident in Sellafield, right? They changed the name of it after, but it was like 50 years ago. But what they went and done was, instead of sending in the 5,000 nuclear plant workers, they went to the theater 
in communities with buses and kidnap the people from the theater rather than have the nuclear workers go in and... To push the burning fuel through uh, into the back of the reactor. But the heat had melted the cartridges, so they'd become stuck inside the core. They were forced to use scaffolding poles they'd found nearby to try and push the cartridges out. Radiation was so intense they could only work a few hours. They were running out of firefighters. The police uh, from the factory had turned up looking for volunteers. Uh, and they brought a bus and they decided the best way to get the volunteers was to go to the cinema and, uh, and volunteer the back two rows uh, at, the, uh, at the show to go into the factory to, uh, as it turned out, to uh, help push the fuel rods out of the, uh, out of the reactor. So they didn't volunteer these people, they went and kidnapped them. Like, do you get what you just learned? If you're not familiar with this subject, you never watched my videos before or something like that. Do you get that? I hope so. The black substance is a million becquels a kilogram. And that's 6,666 uh, unisievers per hour. That's a death sentence. TEPCO, send us people who don't mind dying because it's harmless. Oh, they would have been more danger, Dana, if they went up in a mountain up in Denver. So the worst thing about homeless and destitute that they send in there, because that's what they're asking for. They're asking for day workers. Because most of the people that go to Japan power plant can't read or write on top of that. They wouldn't know to grab those sneakers in case of emergency. Not that that would help you. <laughs> Juno 1 went boom. Yeah, that's a freaking boom, okay? That's not like, you know, like a little fire in the corner. That's a freaking boom. Five sievers per hour at number one. So five sievers will kill you. Uh, you, you might live two weeks, but you'll die within two weeks. If you were to stay there for 20 minutes, you did, mind you. This is unit two. This is 100% meltdown, melt through, melt out. This is unit three. That's unit three again. This, the billing is completely gone. The reactor cores are gone. Just six reactor cores per building. This is unit four. Now, inside of that building, what does it look like? Does it look like that? Or do you think it destroyed? Now, the pole is at the top of the building. The top of the building is gone. And you see the pump truck? That's gone too. So they pulled the wool over your eyes. Don't think they didn't. 14 reactors. Now, a... Uh, Fukushima Prefecture Governor demanded to decommission 10. Okay, once again, this building here, that is what's left of it. And this is what they claim. And here's Seth Dorn. Just a short clip. Of the decommissioning work taking place here in Re Reactor 4. I cut it off like a dummy. But he's claiming right then that is inside the building when it looked like that. It's completely gone. There's no pole in there. Which is what Robert was saying earlier, right? Saying, oh, no, the pole was fine, right? Look, they had a look at it and it looked like that. That's what he was saying inside of the building. This is Harvard. No single weapon competes with the potential damage from Unit 4. They built a structure alongside of it. Those people you see in the picture, they're dead. They're homeless and destitute. If you're within 300 feet of the building, you die within a couple of weeks, maybe a month. If you're that close to it, you're dying within a month anyway. So they're dead. 
uh, still a long way off from power being restored. Now, that's an important headline because what it shows you seven days later, there was no hope. Now, where are you going to plug it in? That's what it looks like for 400 kilometers, yeah? Let's come up and talk about that for a few seconds. Think about the carnage inflicted upon that country. Think about it. People died for that 400 kilometers in the red and they're missing in the yellow because this is what happened to their country. And that's the same spot where the nuclear power plants are too, yeah? Show you another side-by-side -side depiction. So the power plants that we're just talking about 14, there's actually 15. But they, that whole 400 kilometers, those red numbers of dead people are from the pictures on the left. They died because the pictures on the left is what that depiction on the right is telling you. And so Robert, despicable Robert, he'll rot in hell for what he's doing. Okay. And so that's it, I guess, for tonight. The, the buildings blew up. They melted down. They can't get in Chernobyl, and they certainly can't get inside of Fukushima. It's just, there's no way to do it. You, it's a death sentence. And then they pulled the big game over you, and then Robert didn't even charge you a dollar. He came out and done it to you. On purpose. You are not gullible. You are not naive. You just learned that these people are beyond any shadow of a doubt, beyond any shadow of a doubt, vicious lawyers, vicious, disgusting lawyers. That's heartbreaking, trust me. And so we made it through another stream. Next week, we'll do our streams five days a week. 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, British Columbia, Canada time. We come over and send our hugs and wishes, warm wishes and love for everybody. And especially for people that are just learning and trying to understand it and trying to wrap their mind around it. Hugs for everybody. I'm not going to do the countdown tonight on everybody, but I will read the comments after. And uh, Lonnie tomorrow? Tomorrow. No. Wednesday. I got to sleep in <laughs> for a change. I'm ran ragged. Like I'm just, I'm, I got myself ran to the dirt. So we just took a whole four or five days off. Still produce some material, but feel much better. And we got to raise money, everyone. We got to raise some money. We got to fund this. We got to get new life jackets. I got to get more tools. I spent 200 bucks today. I got to get the trailer insured. I got to do work. Got to fix the searchlight on the boat so I can use it properly. I can't take the chance without that searchlight. And like all these little things and just putting fuel in the boat. Like we can't, it's, it's pointless for us to have all this and not use it. It's pointless for me to do the things I'm trying to do uh, in the little bites and bits without coming out and pushing to raise enough money to do it properly. Like, uh, it would be disrespectful for me not to do that. Greenpeace can't survive without all kinds of money thrown in their faces. But look what they have, the, the controversies they were able to drag up because they have that enormous amount of money to be able to burn. If they used it properly, look at what they could really do. It's just, I hate asking, but I don't know any other way. And it's not like this is just some random whatever. We're talking about an extinction event for the Pacific Ocean. We're talking about all the whales now are missing and that the ones we do find are all starving. They're emaciated. Bears emaciate over the winter, but then they eat all summer. The whales, killer whales, 80 of them, 
down here in Puget Sound, emaciated. They can eat halibut and sharks, other whales, seals, sea lions, everything else, rockfish, uh, you know, any of the species in the ocean. And they did. So why are they emaciated? They're emaciated because all of that is gone. We proved that in the documentation. And you can go over to the nuclearproctologist.org. And you will see we've done the entire coastline. We show an extinction event in the nursery. I can't go away. I can't stop. I can't back down. I can't slow down. I have to push full steam ahead. And you have to help me. Because there is, I don't have anyone else to turn to. We are winning the battle. We are the winning team. And our job is not to sit idle boy and be passive. Our job is to lead the charge. Our job is to show that there's a way forward. Our job is to flush out the lawyers. And our job is to be the future checks and balances. And we have to grow. We have to be, we have to rise up to be something that we never dreamt we could be. And we will, will do that because that is the right and moral and ethical thing to do. Hugs for everybody. Dana, do love you. Don't think, if you can't donate, don't think that's, that's bad. That's just the way it is. But anybody that can, for goodness sakes, don't make me constantly beg, because I will. Take care, folks.